Good morning, students, faculty, staff, administration, families, and community of Cheshire Academy. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to speak before you in this virtual space on Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a tradition that came to be 32 years ago when students from your very own school led a peaceful sit-in protest. Special thank you again to Alex Conaway for the opportunity to speak before you all, as well as my appreciation to your head of school, Ms. Julie Anderson. All around the country, school buses did not make this their rounds this morning as schools are closed. The opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange did not ring. Banks, state and federal government offices, courts, libraries, and more, all closed. But again, on a day like today, commonly referred as MLK Day of Action, MLK Day of Service, you embody those two words of action and service as we honor the life and legacy of Dr. King. So although to some it is a day to turn off alarms, disconnect, and rest, which I do think is very important as well, I thank you all for putting this together and showing up. And aren't we grateful uh, for this virtual platform that even though the weather is not ideal, we can still convene. During our time, I encourage you to take notes, write down questions, and reflect. You'd be surprised how an analysis of history with an intentional eye can provide foresight, wisdom, and perspective to our very own lives, and I hope to shed light on that today. So let us begin. Over my heart, I wear what speaks to the unique bond in which Dr. King and I share. On June 22nd, 1952, way before the Civil Rights Movement began, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated welcomed the then Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. into the Brotherhood. So it is with great joy that I speak about my dear brother today. To provide a bit of context, Alpha was founded on Tuesday, December 4th, 1906, on the campus of Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, by seven illustrious college men as the first intercollegiate Greek letter fraternity established for African American men. Our mission is to develop leaders, promote brotherhood and academic excellence, while providing service and advocacy for our communities. We stand on the aims of manly deeds, scholarship, and love for all mankind. I start off with that because as we reflect on the life of Dr. King, it is evident that in every way he embodied the precepts of Alpha. In all that he did, he lived these words out loud. In addition to Dr. King, there are many other men of Alpha that paved the way for the civil rights movement, such as Andrew Young, Thurgood Marshall, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., Edward Brooke, and many, many others. Alpha Phi Alpha is one of nine historically African-American fraternities and sororities which make up the National Pan-Hellenic Council, and I ask your very own Mr. Conaway to speak because his organization is represented in the nine as well. In fact, the two people he will speak about were instrumental to the work of Dr. King. Dr. King's legacy and influence spreads far and wide. Through his nonviolent resistance to racial injustice, he was able to assemble comrades from all over the world. The Reverend Jesse Jackson and William Stewart Nelson, both members of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, were two men who earned a place among King's inner circle. Jesse Jackson, often seen as Martin Luther King's protege, organized a group of fellow students to drive down to Selma, Alabama, answering King's call for supporters 
of the local voting rights campaign in March of 1965. The five-day, 54-mile march with thousands of nonviolent demonstrators is one of the most inspiring moments in American history. William Stewart Nelson, an internationally known expert on nonviolence, also joined the Selma to Montgomery march. Both of these men, key figures of the civil rights movement, were willing to do as much as they could to work towards a common vision for America and to fulfill Dr. King's dream of global peace. Thank you, Mr. Conaway. You know, as we set the stage for the civil rights movement, I think it's important to first define civil rights. They are personal rights guaranteed and protected by the U.S. Constitution, regardless of race, religion, or other personal characteristics. But when you really think about it, these are, these are things black people have been fighting for since 1619, and although slavery was abolished in 1865, immediately after, we saw the rise of Jim Crow laws. These were black codes which legalized racial segregation, and although a number of key moments in history took place from 1865 to 1955, I would like to name three moments in history that helped fuel the start of what is known as the Civil Rights Movement. One, May 17, 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court in the case Brown versus Board of Education declared racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Two, August 25th, 1955, 14-year-old African-American boy Emmett Till was brutally murdered by two white men. Three, December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white rider on a Montgomery municipal bus. The honorable fourth mention, March 2nd, 1955, Claudette Colvin, at the age of 15 years old, was the first to be arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a crowded bus. But on a day like today, I want to live up to the theme of reclaiming the scope of the civil rights movement on a day like today. Although it is important to revisit history, I want us to be motivated to continue this work. I want us to feel empowered by the lessons that this movement teaches us and not just guilty or sad about what happened because that's what Dr. King lived for and not just died for. So do me a favor, if you have not yet, I want you to sit up in your chair and really lock in because now we've done all of our intros, we've set the stage for what led to the civil rights movement, and now we can begin extracting some key lessons that we can apply to our very own lives through our examination of the movement. Today is Dr. King Day, right? A day in which we honor a man of great stature. Well. What if I told you that even though today we look back to a legacy that speaks to how he was the perfect man for the job, but when originally presented with the opportunity to begin this work, there was a point in time where he did not 100% agree. Has that ever been you? Presented with amazing opportunities you did not feel good enough for, stuck in the confines of what is comfortable, wrestling with your potential, gripped by fear, doubt, and maybe even insecurities. Let's take a look at MLK's life. It is important to note that growing up in a church, Reverend King was exposed to social justice work both through his grandfather and father. He watched them lead, their congregations to ensure they were registered voters, active in the NAACP, and in fact, Martin Luther King Sr., King's father, led a civil rights march in 1936. So of course, 
when Dr. King moved to Montgomery, Alabama to become pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in 1954, he took up after his father and insisted all members were registered to vote, active in the NAACP, and he started a social justice committee. The day after Rosa Parks was arrested, Dr. King offered to host a meeting in the basement of his church to strategize. It was at this meeting where they, where they decided to be, begin the Montgomery bus boycott and plan to go public just three days later. Right before their public event, they met one last time where they decided to name themselves Montgomery Improvement Association, MIA, and elected Dr. King as chair. But again, at first, Dr. King was reluctant. He thought, out of all of these preachers who've been here so much longer, why me? I'm only a year into this huge role that I have as pastor of a successful church, and I have a two-month-old and wife to care for at home. This same reluctance was the same reason why nobody else stepped up, and it was when everyone else strayed away in the midst of the risk and doubt and only about 20 minutes to write his first ever political speech, Dr. King jumped in and delivered one of the best speeches ever that evening to a crowd of over 5,000 people. <laughs> what an introduction to a tremendous legacy that began with not feeling like it should have been him. It teaches us that in our weaknesses, insecurities and doubts, even when we feel like we don't have the power to, we can still do amazing things. So on a day like today, if something that you learn encourages you to do something, I hope that the story of Dr. King also empowers you to see it through. Just imagine if Dr. King would have waited for the perfect time. Imagine if he would have given in to the idea of that big picture that seemed too complex and unattainable, so it be best not to try. And the reason why I highlight this is because oftentimes, this is even how we approach the history of our heroes. We say things like, wow, look at all of the great things they did. Yeah, there's no way that could ever be me. Well, it's good looking at it. But I am just wondering if on this morning there is someone who, like MLK, is radical enough to believe there is hope. Radical enough to see yourself in these greats. Radical enough to use your light, your power to do amazing things in this lifetime. Okay, let's get back to the civil rights movement. I get a little passionate sometimes. During the Montgomery bus boycott, African Americans refused to ride city buses in Montgomery, Alabama to combat segregation. To do this, the MIA organized a carpool system that transported people across Montgomery to avoid using the buses. The 13-month resilient uphill movement finally led to a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that stated segregation on public buses was unconstitutional. It was at that time that Dr. King, through his leadership as chair of the MIA, cemented the foundations of community organizing through the nonviolent approach. As mentioned earlier by Mr. Conaway, William Stewart Nelson served as a mentor to Dr. King in many ways through his teaching and deep knowledge of the nonviolent approach. We saw the approach operationalized through peaceful marches, sit-ins, and other forms of civil disobedience. The intentions were to amplify their collective power so much to the point where it would force the government to both hear their demands and be forced to enact positive change. Yet, in many instances, the public, the police, and other institutions responded violently and through the leadership of MLK and the organizing of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, they remain true 
to the ideals of nonviolence. In Stride Toward Freedom, a book written by Dr. King, the six principles of nonviolence can be broken down as follows. One, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. Two, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. Three, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Four, nonviolence holds that suffering for a cause can educate and transform people and societies. Five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Six, nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. What is amazing about the nonviolent approach is that one core element to its, its success was the constant internal analysis that MLK used both to improve and keep at the forefront what the true purpose was. Think about this. In a time where they had to endure the many atrocities of bombings, being blasted with fire hoses and struck by police to only name a few, each time they went back within and reminded themselves and each other of those principles. At marches and protests, you would hear renditions of old hymns and folk music such as, We Shall Overcome. And through it all, no matter how blatant the injustices they faced, MLK continuously sought out areas of improvement. Can you picture that? In the midst of absolute chaos, they could find something within to still sing songs that speak to the hope of a better tomorrow. In the famous I Have a Dream speech, he said, but there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of injustice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence again and again. We must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. He taught us that yes, justice was extremely important, but how they went about achieving it was just as important as well. And they would never stoop down to any level less than excellence in order to get there. Or as the great Desmond Tutu once said, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. Again, as we reclaim the scope of the civil rights movement, I'd like to encourage us to take up the mantle of the nonviolent teaching in our day-to-day -day lives. In a world where so many people are suffering, COVID cases are running rampant, people are in isolation and struggling to convene. In a world where face-to-face -face communication now serves as a barrier for many because we've been so accustomed to being alone, where the need for mental health awareness is at an all-time high, how can we use introspection in spite of calamity like MLK once did? How can we begin to have honest conversations with ourselves? How can we build and strengthen the foundational principles and values that we seek to live by? Similar to the nonviolent approach, will this be countercultural? Of course. But right now, there is a great need for those courageous people listed in the first principle who seek to win friendship and justice as mentioned in the second, who seek to dis defeat injustice and not people as referenced in the third, who seek to find that thing you're willing to live and die for, captured by the fourth principle, who choose love instead of hate as noted in the fifth, and who again believes in its possibility as expressed 
in the sixth principle. So I encourage us all through the relationship built with self to implement these practices in our classrooms, campuses, on social media, and in the world. Because in us all, we have a voice. Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. indeed used his voice. Record has it, he gave 2,500 speeches across six million miles, wrote five books, and published many articles in just an 11 year span of 1957 through 1968. Now, I am not saying we need to go out and do the exact same thing, but I believe the life of Dr. King in the context of the civil rights movement teaches us four things about the power of the voice. We see it through the power to speak, the power to listen, the power to speak down, and the power to ignore. Dr. King used his voice to deliver messages of truth, justice, and righteousness. No matter how uncomfortable or uncommon, he was intentional about every word he spoke. At an interesting point of the civil rights movement came a moment where King had to deliver a tough but needed message at Riverside Church titled, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. This was at a time where the pressures of the Vietnam War became so evident that there was no way King could remain silent. There were people who were truly hoping that the champion of social justice would speak and break the silence. I encourage you to spend some time either reading it or listening to the audio. And before you do so, I want you to envision those moments and times where you yourself had a message or idea you deeply wanted to share, but it was uncomfortable. Think back to the tough conversations you've had to have in your life. And if you are in a place currently where you're holding back on certain conversations or messages you've been deeply wanting to share, let us be reminded that the second thing that Dr. King teaches us about the power of our voice is the power to listen. As great of an art speaking is, King understood that listening was a key component to crafting the strong words that resonate in our hearts and minds once spoken by him. Not only did Dr. King understand the importance of listening, he was also intentional about putting himself in environments that positioned him to listen. And not just to anybody, but to those who've historically been the voiceless. Where did this take place, you may ask? The pool table. As a student at Crozier Theological Seminary, King picked up the art of pool. It was here where he'd spend hours upon hours engaging in deep dialogue and conversation, and it became a part of him. During the civil rights movement, however, he would visit different pool halls and would engage with the people. And just to be clear, he was no novice. You can find pictures of him on Google where he had his back sitting uh, face the table with the pool stick behind him striking at the cue ball. So let us be very clear, this was not something that, that he just picked up and was okay at. King was a pool shark. And he teaches us that a true leader understands the heartbeat of its people. I'll say that one more time. A true leader understands the heartbeat of its people. That in order to be effective in the work that you do in the public, you have to be able to understand and spend time with the people. That you hear the voices of those that you are representing. You hear the voices of those who are not heard. You hear the voices of those who have given up on speaking because they feel like 
Nobody's even listening. Listening sometimes will give you the perfect opportunity to speak and will communicate to you exactly what you need to say. Because it was in these moments where Dr. King was able to effectively educate and encourage people to join forces with the nonviolent campaign. The third one, again, the power to speak down. During his Nobel Peace Prize speech, King stated, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. This quote teaches us that even though evil may appear as though victorious, we must remind ourselves that the absence of justice is temporary. Unconditional love will have the final word. We have to be intentional about not giving into the negative rhetoric in the media, the speaking down we may see, and contributing to a culture that although may appear as triumphant, because ultimately love will win. So I want to take this moment to speak candidly to those who've been doing what is right, who work hard every day, day, to those who feel like their labor is not bearing any fruit, be reminded that the triumphant evil is temporary, that you will be victorious, you will win love, truth, peace, and righteousness, all things good in this world, as Dr. King tells us, will have the final word. Be encouraged and continue on. The fourth and final one, and I won't spend too long on this one, the power to ignore. MLK once said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Remember that there is power in ignoring as well, and it is not a power that is conducive to the movement. Dr. King teaches us that we all have a voice, but you see, it stems far beyond the words that come out of your mouths and make a sound. This morning, I want to be bold enough to say that your voice is your gift. You're singing, you're dancing, you're studying the sports you play, the instruments you play, the art you create, the things you build, whatever your gift is, I encourage you to reclaim the voice that it has and put it into power through the way that you share it with the world and the message that you allow to accompany it. So I want to take this moment and opportunity uh, to provide a platform for a student uh, to share a gift uh, that she so, so graciously decided to share with us on this morning. Uh, so without further ado, I want to quickly share a video from a student, Rania Brown, who will use one of her gifts to help me close out this speech. Hi, my name's Rania Brown and I will be singing a little bit of Believer featuring John Legend. I believe in a light that shines and will never die. Oh, I believe the fires burn and will stay alive. They will talk about us. Oh, like they talked about the kings before us. Well, they will oh, talk about us. Yes, like they talked about us. Thank you again. Uh, definitely appreciate it. Um, and 
if you're on this morning, I just truly want to encourage you uh, to continue on with that gift and all of the other many gifts uh, that you had. Um, when I received the video and I listened to it, um, what I greatly appreciated it about it was the heart in which you had with it. So please continue to share all your gifts uh, with the world. So as I close out, um, again, I want to reference the famous I Have a Dream speech. You know, the speech delivered at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Yes, that one. In this speech, Dr. King spoke power to the civil rights movement as he strongly urged the federal government to take action to fight against racial injustice. He spoke about his hopes for the future, and in fact, this speech was essential to the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. It was also pivotal to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which prohibited racial discrimination in voting. But in the spirit of who I am, in the spirit of who Dr. King was and whose legacy is, in the spirit of the famous lines from that speech that I have a dream. I want to close out first by taking a moment in time to acknowledge the dreams that Dr. King had, the dreams of racial equity, the dreams of freedom, the dreams of justice, the dreams of truth and love having the final say in this world. And I want you to think about the dreams that you may have today. You see, many of the dreams that MLK expressed in that speech were things that people was, were supposed to have and should have today already. You know, one of the things that he speaks a lot about is the U.S. Constitution, which he always said was right there and written about all of the things that people should have. But again, these were things that he communicated as a dream, but deep down he knew should have been his reality. But I want to ask you today, in many ways, we are afforded opportunities to live out the dreams in which he expressed. So what dreams will you take with you to the future? What dreams do you now feel empowered to go after and accomplish now that you've heard these words? What dreams do you now feel inspired to take on? What ways will you allow your light to shine in this world? Some of you will go on and fight the good fight as Dr. King once did. Others would go on and be the educators of our future. Others will be sports athletes, uh, um, uh, sports players, athletes, and people that will go on to do phenomenal things. But whatever your dream is on this morning, whatever that passion or that desire is, I want you to begin to communicate it with the same conviction and power that Dr. King once did, because I don't know about you, but literally as I'm speaking right now, I can hear his words ring in the back of my ear as he said, I have a dream. So what dream do you have on this morning that every day for the rest of your life will continue to ring in the back of your ear so much to the point where you will do everything. You will position yourself. You will posture yourself. You will wake up and go to school and go to class and do all of the things that you know will allow you to make your dream a reality. Because that's ultimately what Dr. King wanted for us all. 
He wanted a world where everyone could be free so that they could go out and live. A world where people can enjoy the justice and truth and righteousness that was spoke to power, well, should have been spoken to power in the U.S. Constitution so that you can go out and again make those biggest and wildest dreams of yours a reality. So as we reclaim the scope of the civil rights movement, as we honor the life and the legacy of Dr. King, I ask you today to, again, continue to, with an intentional eye, look back to our history, see yourself in it, and extract those key lessons so that you can push it forward in your life. Students, faculty, staff, administration, and the community of Cheshire Academy, again, I thank you for providing me with this opportunity on Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Day to share with you all words that I hope you will use in your journey to living out the life of your dreams. And as I always close everything out in which I do, I'll say these three words, never stop dreaming. Thank you.